There have been many a commentary on Netflix's smash hit Korean drama Squid Game that have focused on its merit as a critique of modern capitalism, highlighting how it demonstrates the desperation and degeneracy that humans are capable of when money is their sole motivator. But despite the merit of these observations, I think we miss out on the opportunity for a deeper analysis of the show's themes if we only analyze them through the perspective of one particular economic system. More generally, I think Squid Game offers a far more thought-provoking message on the nature of our relationship and obligation to the society in which we live and the rules that it imposes, whether it possesses a capitalistic form or not. Because across the vast history of human existence, the one thing that all societies have in common, be they communitarian nomadic tribes, sprawling authoritarian empires, or demo-capitalist republics, is a set of rules. Squid Game is a show about a group of indebted everymen participating in dangerous games for cash prizes. Rules dictate almost everything the players do while participating in the games, and in this sense, the games act almost as a microcosm of society at large. I find this to be particularly interesting because of the larger historical context in which the show is taking place. By pure chance, Squid Game happened to release during an era that historians would refer to as a critical juncture, a time directly after and before great societal change and upheaval where established rules have the potential to be radically altered or destroyed outright. Over the last year and a half, people all around the world have been faced with a variety of existential questions about the future. Amidst mass layoffs, small business closures, and spiraling consumer debts, all against the backdrop of a global pandemic, ideas about society's new normal, or lack thereof, have spiraled throughout the internet, sparking massive debate and even spilling out into real-life conflict. In some sense, Squid Game owes as much of its success in this regard to its effectiveness at capitalizing on these pandemic-induced anxieties as it does to its own merit as a piece of dystopian fiction. Though it is a fairly common feature of the dystopian genre to capture such anxieties in the first place. Some of the best works in the genre excel at animating our collective unease about the potential for a world with a new and unfamiliar set of rules than the ones we know. Like, for example, 1999's The Matrix. Like Squid Game, The Matrix was similarly released during a critical juncture, or at least a time that was perceived to be a critical juncture. It capitalized on the Y2K fervor of 1999, posing its own existential questions about how an impending takeover of AI would reshape the human experience, in its case for the worse. I couldn't help but think of The Matrix as I watched the climactic final round of Squid Game, where Gion and his former friend Cho Sang Wu participate in the titular Squid Game. Not just because of the visual similarities, but because of what this moment represented for each story's commentary on societal rules. In a rule-based society, the only thing perhaps more reviled than characters like the agents or the frontman who are responsible for enforcing those rules are the ones who break them, especially to the detriment of another person. To me, Cho Sang Wu's defeat at the hands of Gi Young was reminiscent of Cypher's death in The Matrix, as these were two deceitful characters who, by betraying their comrades, violated an unspoken moral agreement between them and their fellow man. Rightfully, both characters are therefore heavily disliked in their respective fandoms, with most seeing their actions as completely reprehensible. But upon deeper analysis, the rule-breaking behavior exhibited by these two characters emanates from a particular philosophical dilemma that complicates the simple right-wrong dichotomy of their actions. If society is based on rules, then participation in society requires individuals to consent to these rules, even rules that are unwritten. But how can we fully consent to such rules if they are not even formally acknowledged? And what happens if we refuse to consent altogether? In the modern era, we codify our rules in varying explicit forms. Laws, regulations, mandates, etc. Formal proclamations that dictate the how, when, where, and why of human activity through our various systems and institutions. 
But even before humans developed language, writing, and complex systems, they no doubt still had informal rules and procedures that dictated a set of common expectations and obligations from one member of society to the other. But in the void where explicit enumerated rules end and informal rules begin is what truly makes a society. These informal rules coalesce to form perhaps the most important contractual agreement that members of a society enter into with one another, something political theorists, historians, and academics refer to as the social contract. And while unwritten, this social contract is often even more binding on members of society than the formal rules that govern its various institutions. This informal social contract didn't just go away just because humans became more advanced. It still very much exists today. It's not illegal to cheat on your spouse, but it is uncouth and will cause you to lose standing amongst your friends and family. If you know this, this concept is demonstrated at the very beginning of Squid Game. As Gia narrates the explicit rules of the titular game, hop on one foot, stay on the outside, cross the center, tap your foot on the squid, there's a brief moment in between when we see something happen that isn't covered by anything you'd find in an official rulebook. One of the young boys, possibly a young Gion himself, fools his opponent into looking the other way so that he can cross into the center of the ring. Was this technically against the rules? None that were stated, anyway. But informally, this kind of trickery would be viewed by most as poor sportsmanship at the very least and outright cheating at the very worst. Something that might win him the game, but cost him his reputation and good standing amongst his peers. Likewise, it is not any formal set of rules that Cho Sang Wu or Cypher are guilty of violating, but instead this informal social contract. For all we know, it stands to reason that murder is a prosecutable offense in the Matrix's last remaining human city of Zion, but we're never actually given much insight into the politics of the city other than the existence of a council of elders. What we do know is that screwing over the other members of his ship was undoubtedly a violation of the social contract, whether anyone died as a result of his actions or not. Cho Sang Wu deceives Ali to win the game of marbles, throws a competitor to his death to win the game of glass bridge, and murders Kung Sai Byuk in cold blood the night of the final game. But while contemptible and certainly violations of rules in the real world, None of his actions were against any of the explicit rules of the game. Rather, he, like Cypher, betrayed his informal obligation to the other contestants to treat them humanely. This technicality represents the philosophical dilemma I alluded to earlier. If society is based on rules, some of which are unwritten, how can we fully consent to them? And what if we outright refuse? Consent requires the consenting party to be adequately informed of not just the terms of their consent, but the implications as well. In that case, can we truly say that either of these characters consented to their situation? Did Cho Sang Wu truly consent to be part of the Squid Game? And did Cypher truly consent to leave the Matrix? And if not, can we hold them accountable for breaking the rules? Since we don't see the story for any significant period of time from the perspective of either of these characters, I'll assume that their experience being introduced to the Squid Game and the Matrix were the same as the protagonists, Gion and Neo. And if we analyze Gion and Neo's journeys, it reveals a startling lack of transparency that makes the idea of consent truly questionable. Gion is introduced to the Squid Game through an innocent game of Dakji. He continues to take abuse that he otherwise wouldn't tolerate from a stranger because he's desperate for cash and therefore is willing to put up with it. When the mysterious man offers him the chance to play even more games for even more money, it seemed a no-brainer. But notice what the man doesn't say in his monologue. 선생님, 이런 거 며칠만 하시면 큰 돈을 벌수 있습니다. 한번 해보시지 않겠습니까? 빈자리가 얼마 안 남았습니다. 연락 주십시오. 
No mention of the actual terms of participation, including any of the rules, participant amounts, or its deadly stakes. Even when he is presented with an actual consent form, which he does sign, he doesn't truly understand the implication of the document and its various stipulations until the minute the infamous red light green light game begins and participants start getting slaughtered. Given the shocked reactions of everyone in the arena, it's safe to say that no one except the old man knew what they were really signing up for. In The Matrix, Neo is similarly shielded from much of the truth behind The Matrix. Everyone who interacts with him speaks in vague generalities, never any real specifics. Right now, all I can tell you is that you're in danger. I brought you here to warn you. What? They're watching you, Neo. What are you talking about? What? What is happening to me? You are the one, Neo. You see, you may have spent the last few years looking for me, but I've spent my entire life looking for you. What the hell is this? It's necessary, Neo. For our protection. For what? From you. Take off your shirt. What? Stop the car. Listen to me, Copper Top. We don't have time for 20 questions. Right now, there's only one rule. Our way or the highway. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. What does that mean? It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy. Because Kansas is going bye-bye. You'll notice that in both stories, the other parties in the transaction, so to speak, willfully omit information that would allow the consenting party to fully understand what their consent would entail. Their actions and words are almost seductive, in quite a literal sense in Neo's case. He is enticed not just by Morpheus, but by the beautiful Trinity, who acts almost like a honeypot that lures Neo further down the rabbit hole. What is the Matrix? The answer is up there, Neo. It's looking for you, and it will find you if you want it to. Let me give you one piece of advice. Be honest. It's ironic that Trinity's advice to Neo before speaking to Morpheus is for him to be honest when neither she nor Morpheus nor any of the Nebuchadnezzar crew had been anything of the sort to Neo. And I don't buy Morpheus' claim that the Matrix was necessarily something he couldn't explain but instead had to show. A simple hypothetical might have done the trick. If he had asked Neo or any of the number of Zionites he freed from the Matrix whether he would choose living in a dystopian future where the world is ruled by robots or living in an illusion that at least allowed him to live relatively normally, it's possible Neo may have had second thoughts, even if there was only a small chance that this stranger was telling him the truth. I know what you're thinking. Because right now I'm thinking the same thing. Actually, I, I've been thinking it ever since I got here. <sighs> why, oh why, didn't I take the blue pill? <sighs> if we can have sympathy for how Gion and Neo were duped into accepting a deal without adequate consent, why then can't we have sympathy for Cho Sang Wu and Cypher? Because both Cho Sang Wu and Cypher had a choice to participate in the Squid Game and escape the Matrix, their actions are still seen by many as inexcusable, and all these considerations about consent ultimately meaningless. Not only did Cho Sang Wu have the choice to decline participation in the games at the start, he, like the rest, chose to come back and continue playing after surviving the first round. Likewise, the infamous red pill blue pill dichotomy gave Cypher the choice to discover the truth about the Matrix or remain ignorant. But were these truly choices? In the real world, Cho Sang Wu and the other participants of the games were all in crippling financial situations. 
The reason so many went back after being freed the first time is because their lives were functionally over without the prize money. Gion would continue to be pursued by his debtors and would lose his daughter. Cho Seng Wu would be incarcerated and destroy his mother's livelihood. Everything they had or could have was contingent on their success in the games. In this way, the choice presented to them was ultimately a false one. Risk their lives in the games or risk their lives outside of it. Even Cho Seng Wu murdering his competitors might ultimately not have mattered. We already know that the losers in the games are executed, meaning that unless the group that ended up in the final game voted to end it as Gion did, all but one would have perished regardless. For that matter, we see at multiple points that even the game's overseers are being forced to participate, including potentially the mysterious frontman, whose remorse over shooting his brother suggests that his actions may not have been entirely his own. These kinds of false choice dichotomies seemed almost intentionally embedded within Squid Game's narrative. As the mysterious man notes, Guyun already signed away his bodily autonomy without knowing it earlier in the episode, making the choice presented to him inevitable. He was going to have to participate in the games one way or another. It's hard then not to imagine that this scene wasn't just a parlor trick that the organization behind the Squid Game was using to make it seem like he had a choice. And it's hard then not to imagine that the red and blue Dokji pieces were a not so subtle nod to the Matrix, whose red pill blue pill scene is arguably one of the most famous in cinema. Once the architect reveals Neo's true nature in The Matrix Reloaded, it complicates the entire dynamic of the previous film and this iconic choice. If it were destined that Neo would become the one, what choice did he really have in choosing between the pills? And if Neo is part of a grand design, was Cypher's betrayal of the Nebuchadnezzar crew predestined in the same way? This idea of false choice is one of the central themes of The Matrix as a whole. It's perhaps best illustrated during Neo's conversation with Counselor Haman. But we control these machines, they don't control us. Of course not. How could they? The idea is pure nonsense, but it does make one wonder just what is control? If we wanted, we could shut these machines down. <laughs> That's it. You've hit it. That's control, isn't it? we wanted, we'd smash them to bits. Although if we did, we'd have to consider what would happen to our lights, our heat, our air. So we need machines and they need us. The counselor uses their reliance on technology as an allegory to demonstrate how every decision we make is contingent on factors outside of our control, making choice mostly an illusion. In this context, the rule-breaking behavior of Cho Sung Woo and Cypher seems to be an inevitable feature of human society as fundamental to its nature as the rules themselves. Like the rules of the Squid Game or the truth behind the Matrix, our opting into society's various rules is a false choice dichotomy about which none of us receives adequate consent. When we think about what consent means, it typically means the act of providing permission to an individual group or institution to do something to them. I am consenting to a relationship with this person. I am consenting to sharing my user data with this company. In other words, we usually use consent in an active context in which we can also opt out. But societal rules, especially the social contract, are a much more difficult thing to actively consent and opt out of. The consent of an individual to abide by the rules of his locality wherever he may live doesn't negate the contractual relationship he has with those rules. For example, I can choose not to consent to driving within the speed limit, but it doesn't change the fact that if I don't, I'll face a penalty. I can choose not to abide by the customs and norms of my community, but if I don't, I'll be ostracized. We are born and then we are initiated, whether we choose to be or not. Characters like Neo and Gion provide a cathartic outlet through which we experience people fighting against and ultimately overcoming this reality. Their journey represents our subconscious need to fight rigid rules and suffocating status quos. 
And in this sense, we have more in common with Cho Sang Wu and Cypher than most of us are willing to admit. True, Cypher may just be a jerk who'd screw people over in the real world regardless. But Cho Sang Wu was clearly a good guy before the inescapability of his situation pushed him over the edge. Let us not forget that Gyun, who was supposed to be the foil to Cho Sang Wu like an Agent Smith to a Neo, was also willing to violate the social contract, taking advantage of an old man's amnesia to make it to the next round. It's a sobering reality contemplating what this might mean in a real-world context. While I certainly don't justify rule-breaking behavior, critical junctures like the time in which we now live expose the false choice nature of modern society's rules. At some point, if enough people simply choose to opt out from a system of rules over which they have no control or agency to decide, what then becomes of society? Through modern dystopian stories like Squid Game and The Matrix, we're able to explore the human condition and its seemingly contradictory relationship with the rules it constructs for itself. Where on the one hand, we acknowledge the existence and necessity of rules, these rules are simultaneously a prison from which we are all perpetually trying to escape.